The 20th and final RBC Taylor Prize for nonfiction writing will be awarded on Monday. It's a rich field with books that take on timely and difficult topics. It's been our tradition here ahead of the big announcement to welcome the finalists to our studio. So we're pleased to do that again tonight. We welcome in alphabetical order, Mark Bury, author of Bushrunner, The Adventures of Pierre Esprit Radisson. Robin Doolittle, author of Had It Coming, What's Fair in the Age of Hashtag Me Too. Jessica McDermott, author of Highway of Tears, a true story of racism, indifference, and the pursuit of justice for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Zaya Tong, author of The Reality Bubble, Blind Spots, Hidden Truths, and the Dangerous Illusions that Shape Our World. And Timothy C. Weingart, author of The Mosquito, a human history of our deadliest predator. And thank you all for coming into TVO tonight to continue this tradition, which we're so happy to do and so sad to be finishing up. But that's another story for later. Uh, I want to go around the table and find out how each of you decided that this was the thing that you had to devote your lives to doing and why. <laughs> so let's start. Wow. Timothy, a fascination with the mosquito. Where does that come from? Um, it, to make a long story short, every time I finish a book, this is my fifth book, I sit down with my dad, who's an emergency physician in Sarnia, um, and just brainstorm ideas. And he kept saying, you need to do something about disease, disease, disease. And we kept kind of bantering about malaria and mosquitoes. And I had come across, in research from my previous books, dealing with military history and indigenous peoples, um, numerous mentions of specifically malaria and yellow fever. So we started just talking and malaria kept coming up. And I started some preliminary research and got further down the rabbit hole and was semi-convinced that of the, the punching power of this insect across time and in our human existence. And I like doing groceries. It's relaxing for me. I know that sounds funny. I put in some Guns N' Roses and just walk the aisles. <laughs> and uh, I turned the corner in the Safeway back home, and there was this giant billboard that said, Deep Woods Off, may repel mosquitoes that cause dengue, Zika, West Nile. And I just looked at it and went, all right, this is a no-brainer. And then as I, I did more research and, and kept you know, researching, it became very apparent that this tiny little creature has influenced and impacted um, humanity in, in such a degree that if we took the mosquito out of world history, our world and the history we know or think we know would look very, very different. Even having said all that, as you went down that rabbit hole, did you wonder to yourself, is anybody going to read a book about mosquitoes? <laughs> That's what my, my mom, my dad was on board right away, obviously, because it's part, you know, partly his idea. But my mom and, and, and kept telling us, are you sure so people want to read about disease, death, destruction, and about a creature that is universal and that pretty much everybody on the planet hates this animal? And my dad's answer was, yes, Marion, leave the boy alone. Let him do his work. <laughs> um, so I think the story is, it's, not, it's a history book, first and foremost, so it's not really about the, the mosquito itself. It's about how how the mosquito has shaped and impacted uh, human history across our existence. So I, I think that using, looking at history through the lens of this, the mosquito and all the, the pathogens that she delivers and the amount of death and, and suffering is horrific, but I think it's a unique way to look at history and we always assign human agency to so many historical events when in the case, uh, nature plays a huge part and different diseases, and in, in this case, um, all those pathogens that the mosquito transmits. Gotcha. Zaya, you're up next. Let's talk about the reality bubble. Sure. Well, I think that um, like a lot of authors that I've come across, you just don't have a choice. You're quite often compelled to write a book. For me, uh, I'm very much aware that we have 10 years left, according to the UN, if we have any hope of reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're facing catastrophic times. We're very aware that the reality bubble is actually bursting in many places. If we look at what happened quite recently in Australia with 1.25 billion animals being incinerated. If you look at our coral reefs very recently in the news the other day, within 20 years, we're expected to lose 70 to 90% of our coral reefs. These are vital life systems. And at the same time, I was wondering, why doesn't anybody care? Why doesn't anybody care, you know? And I was realizing that people, it's not just because we're apathetic, we're lazy, we're too busy. It's because we live in a bubble. And uh, for most of us, we have this real sense of normalcy around us. And I wanted to address, address that sense of normalcy, but I also wanted to address this world that we simply could not see. And as you know, I've worked with scientists now for about 15 years, and I, I became aware that scientists were seeing 
something vastly different than we were, because they can see far more than our own human eyes can perceive. And so when I started looking through their lenses, whether I was looking through what soil microbiologists would be looking at or marine scientists, they were seeing a very different picture of the world. And I wanted to put that picture of the world together for people so that they could see that full picture as well, beyond the reality bubble, this much bigger picture reality. And um, I wanted to have some fun with it as well while I was doing have it. Have some fun with it as the yeah. world incinerates itself. Yeah, <laughs> joyful resistance has always been yeah. my motto, yeah. there's no doubt. Do you think it's the case that, that people don't seem to care about it or they feel powerless to do anything about it? Which do you think is more accurate? Do I think it's that people don't care or that they are powerless? They feel powerless to do it. This is just so big. A yeah. mission, yeah. we feel powerless to take I on. I think there's definitely a sense that people feel immobilized. And I think it's because of that sense of enormity, right? And, uh, and scale. But that's why I address scale within the book, because I think that so many of our problems, you know, we've inflated far beyond human size. We've let them balloon. But we are in control of actually all of these problems. We managed them. We engineered them at human size. So I think we have to have a fundamental understanding of scale if we are to approach any of these problems in the first place. Gotcha. You still with World Wildlife Fund? I sure am. I'm no longer with uh, WWF Canada. I served eight years, my last uh, year as, as vice chair, but I've just been elected to World Wildlife Fund International, so huh. I'm, I'm a new trustee there. Good stuff. Huge challenges. Holy cow. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Wish me luck. <laughs> Jessica, this, uh, you're telling one of the most tragic stories in Canadian history. What took you there? I grew up there. Um, I was born on Haida Gwaii and then raised in a town called Smithers, which is halfway along what's now known as the Highway of Tears. And is back uh, in the news in a big way these days. It is, it is, for slightly different but yeah. related reasons. Yeah. Um, so this was uh, Indigenous girls and women going missing, turning up murdered, was just sort of a fact of life growing up there. Uh, one person described it, though, as a sad undercurrent. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't really often talked about. And certainly the story didn't leave that area for many, many, many years. Um, so I had always felt that a book needed to be done. This needed to be brought together in one place. These stories needed to be told. That's sort of the least we could do. Uh, and then in my early 20s, I sort of took a stab at it. I went back, I had six weeks, and I thought that that was a totally sufficient amount of time to do a book on the Highway of Tears. Uh, realized very rapidly that that was not possible, um, but it was always there, and I kept following it. I stayed in touch with people who were involved with some of the families, and then several years ago moved back and was actually able to do the story, hmm. do the book. When you heard, uh, I mean, th this is an enormous tragedy, and to have it described as, quote unquote, a sad undercurrent, mm -hmm is very insulting, don't you think? It's horrific. Yeah. And, and I think since then, we've had these sort of blips regionally where there was attention paid. Uh, 2006, there was a symposium done um, by, led by an indigenous group, and they came up with 33 recommendations to make the highway safer. Virtually none of those are in place now. And, and it just, at that time, it was, everybody was on board. We were going to change this. There was government ministers vowing that this was the end of the violence. This was the end of the killing. And then it sort of went away. Uh, we saw that again with the Picton Inquiry that happened in Vancouver. And I'm afraid that we're going to see it again now with the National Inquiry that the report came out in June. And it's been very quiet since then. I actually thought of you in your book the other day when there was that moment when somebody ripped down Remember, there was a blockade and somebody ripped down some of the red dresses that were... And I'm gonna, let's, let's be generous of spirit and assume that the fellow who ripped those dresses down didn't understand the symbolism behind those dresses, that they were there representing the murdered and missing. Mm -hmm. uh, let's assume he just did something stupid, un unrealizing. Uh, still, I mean, when you saw that happen, I just can't imagine what went through you at that moment. It's. It still shocks me. Even after spending five years working on this, I, I just am still um, stunned. And, you know, at the, um, the Unistoten camp, when the police moved in to arrest the, some of the, the people who were there, the matriarchs were doing a ceremony for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls when authorities went in and arrested them mm. in the middle of the ceremony. Not good. No. Not good. Mark, you're up next. I want to know where your fascination with a guy who's been dead for 500 years comes from. <laughs> uh, I think I was more, <clears throat> pardon me, more fascinated with his times than, than with him. It, 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 
he becomes my vehicle to tell the story of those times. So what I, what I was always interested in since I was a really small child were the indigenous people of, of Ontario. And I grew up in Huronia. My great grandfather owned the site of St. Mary among the Hurons, you know, before I was born. Uh, my father had worked on the digs there. Uh, my one of my uncles was like the sort of resident historian on this stuff. So I, I grew up immersed in this, and I lived there until into my 30s, and walked the trails of, of you know Huronia and stuff. So the Iroquois Society had this huge draw for me, and I'd read everything I could get my hands on. Um, it's a pretty quiet place to live, so you have lots of time to read. And I had literally read every book I could find on Iroquois life. And then when I was a university student, I became really interested in how capitalism started. And I didn't realize that these two stories mesh completely. And where Radisson comes in is he lives in the Iroquois world and in the indigenous world, and then he also is part of this new capitalism world, this revolution that starts right at that time. So they come out, Europe comes out of a general European war, the Thirty Years' War, which we think of as, we always sort of see these things as cartoons, right? You know, the people in armor, all that kind of stuff. Thirty Years' War proportionally killed more people than the, the First and Second World War in Europe. It was that devastating. It was a war that through Germany, through uh, Scandinavia, Pol um, Poland, and into England and France, Radisson is a victim of this as a child. Um, revolution breaks out twice in Paris, and that's probably why he got sent over here as a child. And he gets picked up by the Mohawks and taken to the Mohawk country, and he sees this entire world. The thing that makes Radisson different from, say, Jean de Brebeuf or Samuel de Champlain or Le Caron or Hennepin or anybody else who writes at this time is he likes it. He's wide open to new ideas. And he's wide open to experiences that most of us would be utterly terrified in. And because he is, people open up to him. So he is the first French person to be adopted by the Mohawk uh, at 15. He, um, he ends up with refugees up in, the northern, uh, in, in northern uh, Michigan uh, who are blasted out of southern Ontario by the, what they call the Beaver Wars. He goes to... He, he has this weird luck. He shows up in London. It's like us showing up in Wuhan and not knowing that anything's going on. He shows up in London during the Great Plague, and the only reason he arrives at a time when, when he's not going to die is because he's grabbed by pirates on the way and dumped in Spain. He's kidnapped. He's kidnapped by pirates. He's, he's stranded with pirates. He marries a pirate's daughter, which <laughs> reminds me of Shakespeare and love, Ethel, the pirate's daughter, <laughs> among his many wives. Um, he hangs with all of these people who had just come through the English Civil War, who would have these, you know, they're the Duke of this and Duke of that, but they're all ex-pirates and ex-military uh, officers, ferocious people. Um, uh, and he is a ferocious person himself. And then he, you know, concocts this plan to start the Hudson Bay Company to do an end run around the Iroquois and have this, this corporation, you know, go. And he meets everybody who you would want to meet. If you were, if you really knew this area of history well and you were going to be transported in time, you would want to meet Prince Rupert who's sitting in his lab in Windsor Castle trying to turn lead into gold. Or Charles II who's basically repopulating the aristocracy of England with his illegitimate children. <laughs> or the Duke of Albemarle who uh, basically turns Coat <laughs> betrays the English Revolution, or um, you know, admirals who go and, and you know lose a hundred ships to the Dutch. I mean, England. He spends two years in England, stuck in England because England doesn't rule the waves at this point. But for those who are shoppers and who are watching us now, they need to know that the guy who is at the beginning of the founding of the Hudson's Bay Company, the longest continuously running company in. North American history? It is, the, I believe, the second longest joint stock company, operating joint stock company in the world. I think there's one in the hall that's older. Now it's about mm -hmm. to be taken private. And he's there at the beginning of it. And then they forget him. I mean, this is, this is everybody who, who has a job will, re will recognize his life. So he starts up, he says this great idea, he does it, and then they have a couple of management changes and they forget him. He has to go to court and sue because they literally are like, who? Who are you? <laughs> um, and uh, then he basically picks the wrong side politically in, in office politics that are conducted 
on a gargantuan scale. He 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 hooks up. He 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 always has a, a has a, a mentor and and somebody who's sort of running interference from. He hooks up with King James II, who gets overthrown, and that's it for him. So he ends up having to sue. His lawyer screws up the case, goes to the wrong court. Uh, so he only gets part of his money, um, and I, you know, I'm a lawyer, and I went, oh my God, I know how he lost that case. So I explained how he lost the case, um, which nobody academic had ever. You know done. what? I'm going to stop you there because we actually should leave some of the story for people to read if they want to pick no, up the no, book. No, no, I, I want to save everybody as much money. No, as no, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> we, want, we want everybody okay. to buy the books. Uh, Robin, okay, you're batting cleanup here. Where does your book "Had It Coming" emerge from? Uh, so I'm a reporter at the Globe and Mail, and I spent 20 months investigating the way that police handle sexual assault cases, or often mishandle them. And eight months after my series launched, Me Too landed. I initially had no plans to write a book about any of this, but when I started watching what was happening with Me Too and the conversations that were happening around the movement, uh, I started thinking about all of these issues, whether it's consent or the law, redemption, uh, cancel culture, um, through what I had learned doing my reporting on police and sexual assault. We should say, because you haven't said it yet, your series was called Unfounded. And yes. it, was, it was massive in the way that it got police to reconsider how they had been treating some of these cases over the years. Yeah. So well done to you. Thank you. Uh, there were some really amazing things that I, I was fascinated watching. So when Me Too happened, people in Canada would say, you know, we need to change the laws. But what I knew from my unfounded reporting was actually Canada has, so, has some of the most progressive sexual assault laws in the world. Uh, the problem are, the problem's not the laws, it's that people aren't enforcing them. And why is that? And that's rape culture. And that's what I'm really trying to unpack in, in Had It Coming, is rape culture. And that's a phrase that I think can make people feel kind of defensive or roll their eyes or, uh, you know, scream like, yes, obviously, it's wherever you are on the side of this divide that we have right now. So I'm trying to unpack those kind of underlying issues um, and get people to really think about the, the myths and stereotypes that they're carrying around inside of them. Well, that's what I wanted to emphasize because, uh, and I'll, you're going to help me say this, you're going to help me find the right words right, in which yes. to say this, but, but if people have an expectation that this book is, is sort of a very deeply feminist look at this issue, they're going to be disappointed because you do take a very nuanced view of a lot of high profile cases. You did that on purpose, I presume. Yeah, I start the book saying, you know, it would have been easy to write basically just a screaming rant mm -hmm. uh, because I am a human female and have dealt with a lot of this stuff my through my life. But I realized, you know, that just wasn't the right way to do this. And it's, um, when you say, you know, feminist, that, that's a funny thing because what does feminism mean to certain people? Mm -hmm. It is, to me, very feminist. But I also, you know, I spend a lot of the book talking about um, what, you know, men and getting men on side. And it, it's such a tricky thing because I think men are experiencing right now, and I, I've talked to lots of men doing, you know, talking about this book and interviewed, you know, many, many for this. And there's a feeling of defensiveness mm -hmm. with this. And I understand it as, you know, a white person when we have to talk about racism. That, that's kind of how I can understand where some men are feeling right now is there's there's a trigger of this is uncomfortable i feel defensive and we have to push through being uncomfortable and meet each other we're we're all people and humans and um, you know, if you pulled the country right now, are you pro-rape, are you pro-sexual assault, people would say no. Where we differ is what crosses the line and what we do with, with, with people who've committed harm. And our lived experience is going to shape where we come down on that side. Mm. I can't, I've got to do one more question with you because I can't have you here and not ask you about Harvey. The big news this week. The verdict came down this week. When you heard it, what'd you think? On one hand, I was relieved because um, I thought if he if he had been found not guilty, people were going to freak out and think, well, the whole thing is over. Me Too is, is a complete failure. And I was worried because, I mean, that's not the case. Harvey Weinstein has been accused of sexual misconduct and rape by more than 100 women. This was two <laughs> specific allegations that were being dealt with in court. Um, and not unlike the Gian Gomeshi trial, people really kind of put their hopes and dreams on that case. And I was just worried that if it went the other way, it would, you know, create a, a screaming fit, which, of course, you would 
you, you understand where that comes from. Um, I, I think Harvey Weinstein's guilty conviction means everything and nothing. At the same time, uh, the movement is, is progressing slowly uh, because it took a long time to get here. Mm -hmm. And who knows how long the sentence will be? And who knows? And that's the thing is, I, I mean, the, the real benefit of the Harvey Weinstein case is it got us talking about power. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the real layer that it's added to this discussion. Sexual assault, um, sexual harassment doesn't have to be someone physically pinning down a person. When there is a power imbalance, when this person has control over your job, um, they can force you to do things without actually laying a finger on you. And mm -hmm. that's where uh, that case has been so beneficial. I, I, I don't mean this to sound like it's a competition in terms of the relative tragedies of all of the stories you're trying to tell, but I will say, I mean, you are dealing, Jessica, with some of the, you know, most horrendous stories that we see plucked out of the headlines today. And I guess I want to get some better understanding of how you can immerse yourself so deeply in the writing of that story, and it was so personal for you, as you told us already, that you don't yourself become overcome with grief at trying to tell the story. How do you avoid that? You don't, honestly. Hmm. You don't. Um, there were days where, you know, you would go and interview someone for four or five or six or seven hours, and hear these horrendous stories, I mean, not, not just of missing and murdered loved ones, but of all the factors that come into play in that. So colonialism and residential schools and um, the child welfare, so-called welfare system, uh, and all the impacts that that has had. And then all of the repercussions from these losses of, of women and girls that ripple out across families, across communities. And you know, I would leave and just be Grief-stricken, absolutely grief-stricken. But I mean, I think as a journalist, though, it's it's not about you. It's about the story, and that's what keeps you going when it's something that's really important and that you believe in. Uh, you do it. But I wonder whether you feel uh, you're going to write another book. Yeah. Okay. So the question becomes: Do you follow up on this subject, or do you have to get a long way away from this subject and give yourself a break from it now? No. I mean, I'll, I'll never leave this subject. Um, I spent years on this. I built incredible relationships with many of the families. I am still in touch with them all now. Uh, some of them are actually here for some of the events. Uh, this is never going to go away. I think the next book will be, there's a lot of themes that are similar, um, but it's not directly uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women okay. in Canada. Zaya, I'd ask you the same thing. How do, how do you not become overcome mm. by the frustration that the world is not moving fast enough on an issue that you care so deeply about. Right. I, I have to echo what Jessica said. You simply, uh, you have to move through it because um, it's a dark place. And if you actually don't recognize how serious the, the situation is, you can't thoughtfully write any sort of book on it or even article. Um, you know, for a long time, I, I would spend time looking uh, at videos of scientists crying. You know, Arctic scientists crying, marine biologists crying. And um, people aren't paying attention to that, right? Uh, people try and shy away from uh, a lot of things that bring them grief. That's the last thing you want to do is come home at 7 PM and after being in the rat race, turn on something and go through that shock yourself. Um, for me, though, personally, I'm a very bubbly, no pun intended, person. I'm a buoyant, <laughs> happy, joyful person. And I think that my friends even were, they were like, what's happening? Because I had to move through the depth of this. And in some of my talks, I actually bring up the Kubler-Ross graph. I think many of us know that um, when, we, when people face death, they go through uh, anger, shock, denial, and then they go through depression and before they move into acceptance uh, and integration. And I think that's what we're seeing right now today. There are some people in denial, actively seeking out information that the evidence isn't true, just like you would if, if a, with the death of a loved one, but not just the, the death of our ecosystems, right? And then there are people who are immobilized and in that depression phase. But what gives me hope now, and the reason I'm smiling still, is that there are a lot of people who've moved through the depression, as you need to, into active realization of acceptance of what we can do. And I often say to people that uh, solutions are not the problem. On Daily Planet, a show I hosted for a decade, we featured solutions on our show every single day. There's no lack of solutions. The only thing that my editor cut in this book is the epilogue called Solutions, because we knew that that was not the focus of this book. So um, 
there, there is a dark place, but I do believe you can move through it. And writing this book certainly helped me. I wonder if I could get you to speak to that as well, because given the history that you've written of this deadliest predator of all time, you know, we are, some people are anticipating the next pandemic is not that far away and we could be, you know, Spanish flu part two. Right, and I, <laughs> you are right, unfortunately. Um, I think all of us up here, the goal is to educate people as well. And that's why, you know, we do what we do. We have fun writing. We in, in, enjoy it as, a, as what we do. But I think ultimately we want to help educate people on, you know, the environment or indigenous people or the Me Too movement or the Hudson Bay Company. And so um, I think that's part of it. And in the last chapter of the book, I talk about the future of mosquito-borne disease. And with climate change, I can, echoing what Zaya said, is that it's not promising. Um, as the earth warms up, um, we're seeing mosquito species um, essentially invade uh, other parts of the world that are not indigenous to them. So take Canada, for example. In the last 20 um, years, we've seen a 10% increase in mosquito-borne disease. Now, that's mm -hmm. primarily West Nile, but that's also some newcomers. Jamestown Canyon virus, snowshoe hair virus. These are relatively benign viral cousins of, of West Nile. But the big concern, um, whether it's mosquito-borne disease, is the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which carries dengue, chikungunya, Zika, West Nile, is moving north, and it's been identified in southern Ontario and in around Windsor already. So this is a concern, and it's not just mosquito-borne disease with trade, travel, and, and our world becoming a very small global village as it's become in the last, you know, 20, 25 years. Um, just as people crisscross the planet on planes, so do pathogens. And we're seeing this with, with you know, the current coronavirus and the worries about that. And, and Mark and I were talking about this last night, is it's not a matter um, what you're hearing from the CDC, the World Health Organization. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, and we're seeing an increase in mosquito-borne disease too that goes right along with these other pathogens crisscrossing the planet. So would the world be a better place if we had no mosquitoes at all? Um, I don't think so. Mosquitoes serve a variety of functions. For example, they do drink nectar. Only the females bite, but they need the blood to, to grow and mature their eggs, so they're just being good mothers. Uh, it's the pathogens that hitch a free ride via the mosquito that are the issue. So they, do, they are pollinators, um, and there's certain types of orchids, actually, that if we remove mosquitoes, they would be extinct as well. Uh, they're only pollinated by mosquitoes. Um, birds eat them, bats eat them, certain types of fish, trout, salmon, eat the, the eggs and the pupa on top of the water where they breed. So I think I'm a big Star Wars fan, so there's a balance to the force. And if you start <laughs> messing with the balance to the force, you have, there's unintended consequences, and we certainly don't want the Sith coming back. So um, I, I think there's a, an equilibrium and a balance to the force, and when we intrude on that with our own human agencies, uh, we create our, we're our own worst enemy sometime. Can I say something? Yes. I find your lack of faith disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, okay. Can I, like, can I just set up this next question to you by, sure. by forgive the self-indulgent nature of this question, but once upon a time I wrote a book about a former Ontario Premier named John Robarts. Yes. And I never met him, I never even saw him. And it made writing, after I got to know him so well, by talking to 100 other people about him, I thought, Damn, I really wish I'd known this guy. I wonder if you felt the same way about Radisson. This is a guy you... I met John Robarts. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll talk about him another time. No, but how frustrated so were you about the fact um, that you never got to meet Radisson after I, knowing this much about him now? Um, I, I, I got to read his writings, and I think that's how people become immortal in a lot of ways is through their writings. Um, I found his writings to be funny and interesting, and I began to sort of see him as a friend. I could tell him, I actually could figure out when he was lying in his writings. Um, there were little tricks. Uh, and um, so I kind of missed out. I don't know what he looks like. You know, uh, there's a picture, but I don't believe that that's a picture of him at all. Uh, this picture in the book, he looks very glum, and I don't think Radisson looked very glum. I have a fairly good idea of what he looked like simply because he could pass for a Mohawk. So, uh, so I think he gives you a fair idea of, of, of sort of physical characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, he, he, he became like a lot of the friends that I knew uh, through my life. And um, I suppose in some ways I like the mystery. Um, I, I like the mystery that we don't know as parents. I like the mystery that um, 
that he left out a lot of stuff about his love life and things that we can kind of fill the gaps in. But what I do, what I really did like about him was the, how much he really enjoyed his own life. So when he goes as a child and lives among the Mohawks and we see this world and I, and I use him to open up this whole world and talk about a country that, that we will never see, that I would love to have seen. And he gets to live in that and he gets to live in it as a very privileged, lucky person. And um, I came out of it, you know, thinking that he is a sort of a part of my life. And I'd written this book after writing two quite depressing books, and I'm going to write another depressing book soon. So it became <laughs> like a palate cleanser. Um, and, um, and, 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 I, and I really kind of needed him and needed to, to, to have this sort of tongue-in-cheek history to write after writing about um, right-wing um, governments controlling information, a dark, uh, dark web material. Those are my last two books. And my next book is about basically creeping fascism in Ontario in the 30s. <laughs> so, so You're Radisson, just full of yucks today. Radisson, is, yeah. Radisson is like the guy I have over after work. Who shoots the breeze and tells me good stories. Good stuff. We've got just a few minutes left here, and I want to point out the fact that this is the last Taylor Prize that will be awarded. Uh, the prize is winding up after this year, and I just want to get a little touchy-feely here. Robin, maybe start us off. <laughs> What's going to be lost when this prize disappears? I mean, we've been talking about this a lot the last few days or through Twitter DMs the last <laughs> month. Um, the reality is Canada is a small country, population-wise, and it's hard to do big research. All of these books are research-intensive nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And I think almost all of us have like very demanding day jobs as well, and families and outside work, and, and trying to find um, an audience for these books that can sustain the cost of producing them is really mm -hmm. challenging. And that's why prizes like this are so important because um, they give us an opportunity to, to tell people about it and come on and do these types of shows and, um, and uh, you know, get, get these books in people's hands. And uh, I really, you know, I'm so grateful to Noreen Taylor and, and what she's been doing for 20 years. And I, I hope someone else steps in um, to fill those shoes and maybe not the same way, um, but it, it's invaluable, this kind of, of uh, event. Zai, want to take the last minute on this? Sure, I just returned from London doing my book tour there. And uh, you can see that just in terms of how how the business of book selling is set up there. Uh, nonfiction is incredibly popular there, and they have these sorts of festivals, these prizes, and they're invaluable, right? Because this is the sort of platform that is given to nonfiction writers. Here in Canada, I don't quote me on the number, but it's something like 15% of our nonfiction comes from Canadian writers. And so, um, you know, I think that we all need as much help as we can get because writing nonfiction, the reason everybody has a day job is because you can't sustain yourself uh, just by writing a book. It's not possible. Um, and well, so, unless your last name's Atwood. Well, yeah, bless her, you know, but, but it, it's, it's certainly tricky. So uh, it's a big loss. It's a big loss. I hope, I, like you, I really hope somebody else steps in. Well, you guys are going to have a great weekend. I guess it all starts tonight. Big dinner tonight. Plans for the weekend. Monday, the announcement is made. And congratulations to all of you on getting nominated. You've all done great work. Mr. Director, can we have a wide shot, please, to celebrate these five wonderful authors? Congratulations to all, and Thank good you. luck. Thank, Thank you. you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.